bread, I've not understood a lot of trestle, <laughs> trestle tables. Uh, and one of them was a trellis table, Challenge. which is just a mistake. It's a, a spelling mistake in Oxford. Um, yeah, and people come to the Oxford Bar, you know, they write the Ian Rank in Oxford Bar, Scotland, and they send the letters and things there. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I do have to go in there to do research. Yeah. 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 I pick up my mail. I pick up my mail. It's the only reason I go in. Two reasons. One to do research and two to pick up all my mail. Yeah. Right. And so after four points of research, then you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got, to, yeah, you've got to make sure that nothing's changed since the last time you were in. Um, I wanted to go back a bit and ask about when you started writing, because you said you did really intend to start off as a crime writer, and you said something interesting which nobody could say now, partly thanks to you is that when you started there was no tradition of crime fiction in Scotland, uh, apart maybe from Widow McIlvany, but is that fair? Well, it's, it's kind of weird because the most, possibly the most famous crime writer of all time is Scottish, yeah. Conan Doyle. And there are audio recordings of Conan Doyle on the internet, and he has a very pronounced Scottish accent mm -hmm. his whole life. But, you know, growing up in Scotland, I never thought of him as Scottish. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of weird, but you know, he left Scotland as soon as he could in 19 or 20 and didn't really come back after. Didn't choose to set his, his books in Scotland, chose to set them in London. And although Sherlock Holmes was based on one of his professors at university, um, Sherlock Holmes doesn't seem to have much Scottish resonance. No. Um, and so, I, you know, so he wasn't around. Uh, he's more around now, there's a statue of Sherlock Holmes, there's a Conan Doyle pub and all the rest of it. But back then he wasn't. Michael Barney um, was interesting because he was a literary novelist who then wrote three crime novels. And so I didn't see any disparity between literary fiction and crime fiction. They were the same thing, just good books and bad books. Um, and around the same time, you know, I think a lot of us who did eventually become crime writers, we, we were interested in Gothic. Mm. It was psychological Gothic suspense, so it was Jekyll and Hyde. Okay. And memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner, mm. um, stuff like that, and kind of ghost stories and creepy stories, um, and added to which there was a kind of urban novel coming out of Glasgow at the time. So as well as Louis Macrobani, you had Lanark and you had uh, James Kelman, yeah. amongst others. So it was a kind of gritty, almost noir thing happening in Glasgow. And then one or two of us thought, why is that not happening in Edinburgh? And so Rebus came along and Trainspot came along. Um, and showed that Edinburgh wasn't a museum piece, it wasn't just a tourist destination. Um, it was a real living, breathing, contemporary city with real problems. And crime fiction is fantastic if you want to discuss those problems. Mm. And uh, I mean, if you just uh, tell the story about William McIlvany in the book slightly, like in many yeah. of you here, I think it was three years ago, William McIlvany. Um, oh, the, uh, yes, uh, he died at the end of last year. <coughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I forget, but it was either 82 or 85 at the Edinburgh Book Festival, because at that time, um, the Edinburgh Book Festival was only every two years, and it was one of the first. The first one was 83, the second one was 85, and I went along with my partner copy of one of his novels, uh, and I said, I wonder if you'd sign up for him as a Marco Vanni, I'm writing a book that's a bit like Laidlaw, but set in Edinburgh, and he wrote me good luck with the Edinburgh Laidlaw. And then I met him, it must be 15, 20 years later, um, his latest novel then was called Weekend, and I said, we sign up for William, and yeah, the Edinburgh Laidlaw done good. <laughs> and uh, I just thought that was terrific. But, uh, you know, it's a, it a nice thing nice about the crime community, the crime reading community, as well as the crime writing community. He was staggered to find how popular and how loved he was. Because mm -hmm. he puts it out of print for years, out of print for years. And when he came back into print, he was invited along to Harrogate and to here and to Edinburgh and there'd be a room full of people. Mm. I mean, I interviewed him at Harrogate um, a few years ago, and it was Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Sunday morning, ballroom, and we're, we're, in, we're in the green room, and he said, do you think anybody woke up yet? Mm. And I said, oh, I think there'll be a few folk there. And we walked in the back of the room, and the place was just full. Yeah. And he was, he was absolutely, he was humbled yeah. by it, and, and staggered by it, and, and thrilled. That's wonderful. He was thrilled by it, and we'd never forgotten him. Mm. You know, the literary, world might have forgotten, but the crime writing community and the crime reading community were just so keen to see him again. And he was what a great entertainer he was, and what a great human being he was. Yeah. And the Clark Gable good looks of course. <laughs> you know, a very debonair man. Yes, I remember people swooning over him uh, a few years ago here. Yeah, so. Well, when, it, when Black and Blue came out, um, which was the first successful Rebus novel, I was doing a, a, a talk and a signing at um, a booksmiths, which is an independent bookstore in Glasgow. John Smith's bookshop. And he came along, and there were no seats. 
So he just sat on the floor. Mm. You know, and he just turned up because he sort of vaguely knew him. And we went for a few drinks afterwards, which was lovely. But he just turned up to the reading um, to see how it was getting on. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, well, isn't, you mentioned black and blue, right? And that's an uh, interesting book of yours to talk about because that was famously your breakthrough novel. I think you've been published already for 11 years by my account then. Um, so it's been a bit of a slog to get recognition. It was an apprenticeship. Okay. <laughs> it was a long apprenticeship. Yeah, it took, I mean, it did take a while. And you know, there were a lot of times when I was nearly getting dropped from the publisher. You know, I was seen as being middleist, which means you're selling enough copies to break even, but you're not set the world on fire. There'd been four or five Rebus novels, so they thought, well, if he hasn't broken through yet, it's probably not going to break through. Maybe you should try a standalone book, try something different. Obviously, you're not going to, you know, make it a crime writer, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then Black and Blue came along, which was just a bigger book. So, um, in terms of plot, in terms of structure, in terms of themes, it was just a much bigger book. Heavily influenced by James Elroy, mm. who I was reading a lot of at the time. He, he used real criminals, real crimes, real history. I did the same thing in Black and Blue, bringing a Glasgow serial killer called Bible John, who existed, I think, in the late 60s, killed three women and then disappeared. Um, yeah, and you know, I remember when it, the, the week it came out in the UK, it was early January, and we were homeless. Mm. We were between um, legs of flats, and we were staying with friends in Yorkshire with our two kids. And um, Marcel Berlin's in the Times was a little teaser saying the best crime novel of what year it was, 1992. Um, it's already been published. Mm. I'll tell you what it is tomorrow, I'll tell you what it is. Yeah. You know, and I bought the paper the next day wondering what the hell is it? And it was black and blue. <laughs> you black and blue. Uh, and it was just a thrill. And that was January and November that year at Wonder Gold Dagger. Yeah. And that was the yes. first inkling I got yes. that I knew what I was doing. It was a bit later than 92 because you had been writing. Before. Was it 90, When was it? Well, I mean, the first book was 97. 97, sorry, 92 I went to America. Yeah, 97 was. Um, yeah, 97. And the first Rebus was 87. And the first book I wrote published was 86. So it had been a long apprenticeship. Yeah. I read an interview with you once, I don't know if you still feel it, you say your son, your younger son, Kit, was he 94 he was born? Uh, yeah. And uh, he has a serious genetic condition. Yeah. And you did say maybe some of the anger you were feeling at the time, the unfairness spread into the book. I'm sure that's true. I mean, I said, I've said this already, that books being therapy, books being therapeutic for the writer. It's a way of dealing with problems and issues, and it's certainly a way of dealing with stuff in your own life. Um, and, you know, I, we were living in France, I didn't speak much French, we were having to go to the I mean, we thought Kip was fine, he wasn't diagnosed right from the get-go, when he was about two or three, no, maybe ten weeks, three months old, something like that, we thought he's not doing much, he's been lying on the floor, he's not turning over, he's not trying something. So the local doctor said, I'm sure he's, I'm sure it's fine, then he said, well, he sent us to the hospital, and Perry went to the hospital, and he said, well, let's go roll over some tests. And it took a while for it to be to get the diagnosis of simple endangerment syndrome. Um, and throughout that process, number one, language was letting me down. Mm. Because I couldn't understand what these French medical people were saying to me. Yeah. And although Miranda, my wife, speaks very good French, she doesn't speak medical French, and she wasn't yeah. very good at reading between the lines that they were trying not to tell you. They were hoping you would get it without them spelling out. And then we'd drive, so we drove 50 kilometers to the hospital to have a consultation, 50 kilometers back to our farmhouse. I would climb up the rickety, rickety ladder into the attic and, and write black and blue. And so I would channel all that frustration about not using language properly, frustration about not quite knowing what was going on, um, and an eventual anger, why me, why us, you know, why has this happened to us? Um, all of that got channeled into that book and made a big anger book, and in the very next book, Rebus' dog got yeah. hit and run and put in a wheelchair, because by then we learned that Kip would probably never walk. Kit's 22 in July and he, he doesn't walk in the wheelchair. Um, so I took it up and read it, read it as, a, as, a, as a kind of punch bag for about two or three books. And it was useful for me, it was therapy, it was cathartic. And, uh, People say that about crime writers. They say we didn't write all this stuff down, we were very dangerous in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you that's, that's true. I, think it's, no, I, think it, I keep teasing um, romance writers saying that because they don't put any of this dark stuff down on the page, because it means they are quite dangerous in the middle. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's true or not, but obviously, where does this stuff come from? All this stuff in our books comes from the inside of our heads, it comes from our subconscious, if not our conscious imagination. So we've got all these thoughts. Yeah. 